So this is the first in the series of lectures, talks about pastoralism, and we're going to be covering a whole series of topics. But this one is essentially an overview, drawing particularly on the literature from Africa. The next uh, presentation will be focusing on a much more global perspective. But I wanted to offer you some perspectives and quite personal perspectives on some of the debates that are associated with pastoralism from my reading and engagement with the literature and these debates over quite a few years. So, as you'll be aware, presentations of pastoralism in the public media and indeed within the literature tend to be characterised by two quite contrasting narratives, if you like. Um, one, a very doom and gloom version that pastoralism is nearing its end, there's a permanent crisis of pastoralism, and the other more focused on opportunity and hope, that there are things, dynamic things happening within pastoral societies and economies, uh, fueled by the growth of commercialization, that can be built on. I think the, of course, the dominant narratives tend to be rather negative um, wherever we look and certainly within Africa. Um, the pastoralism in crisis, permanent environmental degradation, the collapse of uh, pastoral systems in the face of climate change um, are all there. And indeed the focus of aid agencies and others on safety nets, food aid, uh, recurrent emergencies in pastoral areas, in a sense reinforces this, both in policy imaginations and public imaginations. And the response of states, again in Africa, but this is replicated elsewhere, is to intervene and try and modernize what is seen as, as backward pastoral systems, settle people, to invest in new forms of, of technology. In the African context as well, and again replicated elsewhere, pastoralists are often seen as threatening to the settled state. They're outsiders, often in the margins of state, at the margins of state authority, places where conflict occurs, where counterinsurgencies happen, where secessionist uh, movements emerge, and where terrorism is, uh, is fostered. And we see this again and again um, in different places. But I think it's also worth recognizing, and I think the Pastres program is very much centered on this premise, is that there are lots of alternative, what one might call quiet narratives going on in parallel, things that are not so easily uh, presented as a, in a simple crisis mode, but ones that show things are happening. The growth of commercialization, uh, expanding markets, benefits uh, to uh, pastoralists, uh, decentralization policies, local control over land, variety of different innovations, technological and social, uh, with pastoralists taking the lead, and value-added diversification that's happening in pastoral economies. In many pastoral areas, uh, in many countries actually, where there are pastoral areas, the fastest growing urban centers are offering, often in, in pastoral areas. So there are positive things to, to look at in pastoral setting. So what is pastoralism? We ask these two camels in Isiolo, and uh, they didn't necessarily know, looking in opposite directions. Pastoralism is one of these concepts which has often a technical definition associated with, um, with livestock production but also a more uh, ecological or socio-ecological definition uh, associated with thinking about pastoralism as a socio-technology for converting highly variable resources, both in space and time, into food or other livelihood products. That's one that captures, in essence, a focus on, on the uncertainty of, of the environmental conditions. But others will, will focus on pastoralism as an identity, as a cultural form, as a sense of, of, of belonging to a particular, um, a particular ethnic or, or wider cultural group. 
So I'm not going to dwell too much on the definition of pastoralism. Everyone will come to their own version. But there are some characteristics that I think are important, which are uh, importantly related to what I've already mentioned, the highly variable nature of resources that pastoralists have to capture. And I think one of these is to think hard about, in, in any setting that people are working in, hard about how production systems and management systems of livestock are, are um, constructed. What are the elements of those, social, technical, um, economic, and so on? And there's a book that was very influential for me when I started out on my PhD in the 1980s. It was written in the 70s by Anders Hjort and um, Gudrun Dahl called Pastoral Herd Growth and, and, and Household Economy, Having Herds. And I found this, as then an ecologist, a useful combination of thinking about the production system, the basic characteristics of production of different types of, of animals, um, and the, uh, the livelihood outcomes that they deliver. And we were discussing production, forage, veterinary issues in a later session. And they're very critical in the introduction. And Gudrun and Anders you know, had an anthropological background, but were interested in, in pastoral systems from a technical point of view. They were very critical of the traditional anthropological studies of pastoralism, of which there are many. You know, from Evans Pritchard um, on the Nua um, to Herskovitz's description of the cattle complex, which tried to focus in on what they understood, often from an outsider's colonial perspective, um, what, uh, what was the essence of pastoralism. But in this book, they were critical of that and sort of got into the basic story about births, deaths, population dynamics, how different, uh, ha how having herds or flocks uh, resulted in producing meat or milk or both and, and so on, and what that meant. And for the strategies that pastoralists follow to cope with this variable environment, strategies such as, as diversification of, of the type of animals people have, mixes of, of small stock and large stock, herd splitting, movement, and, uh, and the deployment of labor uh, to make this happen. And I think understanding those basic production characteristics is very, very important. Also important and relevant to our discussions, and we'll come to this in a minute, is how many animals does it take to keep, an anim uh, to, to keep a family alive? Um, if you're a pure pastoralist only surviving on livestock, that's a certain number or a certain combination. Uh, if you're combining with other sources of income, it will be different. And that is, is a significant uh, debate about how and why pastoralism can or cannot survive under different uh, circumstances. <coughs> but whether we're talking about cattle, camels, yaks, sheep, goats, or any combination of those, uh, these dynamics will be different and they'll be different in different places, as you know. So, where do pastoralists live? This is a map of rangelands of the world, which, depending on how you count rangelands, and there are various definitions of that, covers between 25 and 45 percent of the whole world's surface. It's one of the largest, um, it's probably the largest, type of, uh, of ecology uh, on the globe's surface. There are warm and dry rangelands, about 60% of the total rangelands, and there are cold rangelands in montane settings, around 16%, and a variety of other different types of rangeland uh, that are classified in these type of analyses. They can include grasslands, they can include savannas, they can include shrublands. There are many different types of hot and cold deserts, steppes, tundras, alpine uh, vegetation, marshes, and so on. And in any different setting, understanding how those different types of rangeland interact in an area is crucial to understanding how pastoralism can, can, can uh, operate. But what's What's common to all rangeland setting, settings is that the ecologies are harsh, uh, 
the uh, environment is highly variable and in certainly in the more more uh, extreme settings alternative livelihoods including agriculture are simply not possible unless there are significant investments in irrigation and other other sorts of infrastructure so so livestock production is the dominant mode of using the majority of the earth's surface um, according to that argument and about 90% and again, the figures vary depending on how you count, um, of these rangelands are what might be called extensive rangelands, where movement is possible, not necessarily fenced and privatised, although that, as we'll come to, is, is changing. And they have relatively limited agriculture within those areas. There's another 9%, 9 or 10%, where there's a mix of grazing and cultivation land. And, and again, the frontier of agricultural land is changing. Now, there's only 3% of the world's population that live in these areas, so the, re the relationship between land and people is quite different to settled areas, and that's important to understand, both for ecology but also for politics. Um, but it's also the home of 35% of the world's sheep, 23% of the world's goats, and 16% of the world's cattle and buffalo, um, not to mention yaks and camels and other, uh, and other species. So a very significant area of the world and of the world's production. But it's also an area where a lot of poverty is concentrated. This is a, um, a figure from a study done by ILRI, International Livestock Research Institute, looking at, at, uh, at livestock keepers in, in relation to um, national rural poverty lines. And you can see from the diagram that in Africa and good swathes of Asia which overlap with these rangelands a lot of the world's poorest people live so the relationship between poverty livestock rangelands uh, becomes important in thinking about how uh, how we think about pastoralism as a whole so within this we can see that around two-thirds of overall rangelands are in Asia and Africa so Asia and Africa by far the dominant uh, area of rangeland and uh, most of those are are extensive rangelands used in, in common other areas include the americas which tend to be much more uh, privatized in form in the forms of, of ranches um, and as i said land use in these areas is traditionally extensive livestock production and probably the only land use uh, that is has been sustainable over many years but as we'll talk about in a number of the sessions coming these places are also being contested um, uh, minerals exploitation alternative energy wind solar geothermal uh, the use of eco uh, the development of ecosystem services carbon sequestration biodiversity conservation tourism are all competing land uses in the rangelands and are features of thinking about pastoralism in the contemporary setting. So we have, as it were, as, as I've said, competing narratives not only about the future of pastoralism but competing narratives about how rangeland should be used. So a narrative, according to Emery Rowe, is, a sim is simply a storyline that we tell about the world. It's a, it has a, a beginning, a middle, an end, like any story, and tells us a little bit about the problems that are faced and the solutions. It's told about development all the time and is central to how policy processes are constructed discursively, but also how policy processes are uh, linked to particular groups of actors and networks of actors and particular interests, political, commercial and others. It's essentially about knowledge, the relationship of knowledge and power. So if we're going to think about pastoral land use, we have to think about knowledge and power, as well as the biophysical questions. So here are three pictures of uh, one of the pastoral study sites um, in Isiolo in northern Kenya. Three, as it were, alternative views of how this land should be used, each associated with a particular narrative of what is appropriate land use. So the first picture is one of, of extensive livestock use, in this case um, uh, camel browsing, traditional pastoralism. 
So a narrative around that is that this is a sustainable and effective form of, of land use that uh, provides uh, people livelihoods and so on. An alternative view, and I tried to get the same type of acacia bush in the picture, is to say, well, actually the most appropriate use and most beneficial use is to have this as, these as conservation areas. Um, elephants, in this case, in a nearby uh, national reserve. Um, this can provide tourist revenue, provide ecosystem services, it doesn't suffer the same forms of degradation that pastoralists do, and pastoralists can always benefit from this because we can employ them as guards or whatever in, in the tourist concerns. So the relationship between pastoralism and conservation is a big one. Another view is to say, well, actually, long term, We've got to industrialise and transform these areas. This is a picture of Isiolo Airport, um, an international airport, it claims, although I don't think there are many planes that go there yet. Um, but uh, here is an alternative vision for uh, dry land areas. If we invest in these areas, we develop these areas, we can modernise and transform them. We don't have to have either elephants or pastoralists or we have or we use them in, in, in or we uh, see them in combination so wherever you look in pastoral areas these sort of competitions I've simplified it here there may be five or six different competing narratives or there may be just two that are really fighting it out in a particular area but we see different visions for these dryland areas and increasingly as dryland areas become the frontier for the expansion of of capitalist intervention in, in economies, uh, these contests become increasingly uh, fraught, uh, often arising with conflict. Here's a picture of southern Ethiopia. Um, this is uh, in Burana, um, where debates about pastoralism, if you're going to look at anywhere in Certainly the Greater Horn of Africa, Southern Ethiopia is probably the place you can look at where contestations over the future of development of pastoralism have really been fought out over decades. Um, 50 or 60 years of attempts to develop, in inverted commas, pastoral areas. So what are the narratives we've seen uh, uh, playing out in these areas? And you can think whether these apply to areas where where you work. One of the things I did a number of years ago um, was run a course for Ethiopian government officials, veterinarians and others, policy makers, NGOs on pastoral policy. And I wanted to locate that course in their own experience and their own setting. And I knew that there were had been lots and lots of interventions in the Burana, southern Ethiopia area over the years. So I rang, rang up a colleague in the Ministry of Agriculture in Addis Ababa and said, can you just send me any of the past reports and project reports on this area, assuming that would be just a simple exercise. He couldn't find anything. There was nothing in the ministry that, as it were, told the history, the archaeology of development in these areas, despite the fact that the World Bank and IFAD and others were proposing a massive new investment at that time in pastoralism in that area. And this is one of the things you see again and again in debates about development and policy, is that the past is forgotten um, and the future is reinvented again and again, often with exactly the same mistakes. Um, and perhaps it happens more often in pastoral areas, I don't know. It seems, to, it seems to, partly because of the politics of the type of policy narratives that impinge. Anyway, he's a, he was a good friend of mine and he looked hard and in the end, in a locked box trunk in the basement of the building, uh, they found these reports. I, in the meantime, I'd ask all the consultants, now retired, scattered around the UK and the US and so on, if they could find them, because they were involved in some of these projects. And various people in their retirement went into their lofts and looked for old reports. And it was amazing. The history had been wiped out. Anyway, we found them. They're in my office. Um, and here are some of them, some of the summaries. And they went back in the end to 1970. 
This is the Ethiopian Government Livestock and Meat Board. Brief summary. I took some photos of the front covers. Brief summary of the Southern Rangelands Livestock Development Pro uh, Ethiopia, 1974. Then the Imperial Ethiopian I'm Government... Some trouble with the Ethiopian Government Livestock and Meat Board. Again, Southern Livestock Rangeland Development Projects, 1974. Again. Ethiopia Appraisal, Rangelands Development Project, 1975, this time a World Bank Appraisal. Uh, next one, uh, an Australian consulting company, Project Preparation Report, South East Rangelands Project. Uh, staff Appraisal Project, the fourth livestock development project. Remember, this is, this is the fourth, so there was the first, second and third, which were associated with those earlier ones. That, this one was in the early 80s. Then in the late 80s, another appraisal report, this time done by the African Development Bank. And, and, then, and, and then finally, one that was uh, a project appraisal document for what became the Pastoral Communi Community Development Project, the PCDP, uh, in the early 2000s. So this was a, I mean, I've taken an example from Ethiopia, but one could look at any place probably in the world and find that history of attempted interventions. What we did in the workshop, and it was really interesting because some of the people who earlier in their careers were junior people employed in the 70s and 80s on some of these projects, we looked at, well, what were the features of how these projects were designed? And it was extraordinary. Uh, the continuity. So there was a overall modernizing narrative about, um, about pastoralism. These were backward places that needed modernizing, they needed incorporating into the state, they needed um, commercializing, they needed new technology and they needed settling. Right from the imperial government in the 19, late 1960s, early 70s go to the 2000s, it's slightly more couched in participatory, gender, inclusion, community-based type language. But the underlying narrative is almost identical. One's going to use com community participation in order to encourage people to engage in the market or settle or whatever. One must involve women in order to do that. And so on. I'm being a little bit cynical, but you can have a look at the documents and get a sense of them. Now, these were done by well-meaning people, professionals, and so on. Um, I'm not saying that any of these people were doing the, this maliciously, but what didn't happen was a learning along the way. There was no reflection on what failed. Um, about this time, I went... Um, on a long car journey south from Addis Ababa down to Yabolo and, and Moyali, down, right down south, and one can see if you look into the bush, or left and right, the the remnants of these earlier interventions, old market sites that have been just left, community um, development buildings that have been left, and so on. A bit sad. But that is the story of pastoral development in Africa and, I suspect, elsewhere in the world. Part of those investments included investments in schools, in healthcare and so on, all of which um, were important types of investment. And there were import imports of some forms of technology which were, were significant, including um, new breeds and so on. But whether you look at the imperial regi regime of Haile Selassie, the socialist military Derg regime, or the uh, post-92 EPRDF regime, three totally different political regimes, one saw the same version of pastoral development produced by experts, implemented by government, and with large amounts of money following on. So there was a lesson there, and it was a striking lesson for both me and Ethiopian colleagues, but it's one that I think is worth reflecting on more broadly, beyond the specific Ethiopian case, to think about how does pastoral development happen and what are the, what's the sort of thinking that goes into it and how is it framed? Because as researchers, practitioners, policy people, we have to 
critically engage with that and think about it uh, in ways that we don't end up just repeating the same cycle ad infinitum. So these debates about pastoral development have been going on for a long time. And this slide includes some covers of books that date from 1975 until 1994. And I could have chosen dozens of other ones. But each of these perhaps represents in the African debate about pastoralism key moments when people got together and thought, what's the future of pastoralism in Africa? Um, the first one is, was a, 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 an, ed is an edited uh, volume by Mono uh, from 1975. Uh, the second one is, is, uh, is, was edited by John Galati, Galati uh, in 1980. The third um, was one of the early uh, interventions by then ILCA, which when merged became ILRI, the International Livestock Centre for Africa as it was. Um, when they initiated a whole series of system studies uh, from the early 1980s um, to try and analyse in a more integrated way pastoral systems and uh, drawing on farming systems research applying them elsewhere. Uh, in 1983 uh, Stephen Sanford published Management of Pastoral Development in the Third World which was in a way a predecessor of the debates that, that followed 1983 is quite a long time ago now, um, where he raised many of these questions um, critical of mainstream conventional pastoral development um, uh, geared to a, uh, a public policy audience. And then there are a pair of books that I was involved in early after, soon after my PhD, where I'd engaged in, in, in debates about range ecology uh, where we try to link, and we'll come back to these themes in a subsequent uh, uh, talk uh, on um, new ecology, new thinking about, uh, about rangelands, where we try to engage with emerging debates um, uh, in ecological science that questioned a sort of simplistic, narrow view about, um, about how uh, pastoral systems uh, worked and in turn challenge all of these um, basic precepts of pastoral development and rangeland development in particular. So you'd think that all of this research, academic, policy investment would change views, paradigms would change. The, uh, the latter two books sort of announced the new paradigm in pastoral development and now they're 25 years old. Um, change doesn't necessarily happen as quickly and smoothly as you'd hope um, and I think that's one of the debates that we'll be having through this series of, of lectures is how again knowledge uh, research interacts with policy but of course policy proceeds and uh, subsequent to all of these debates that here end in the mid uh, 1990s We've had lots of other debates about pastoralism um, and the literature is, is, is rich and it's full of very engaged discussions about um, the top left about the environmental consequences of livestock production, an FAO document that became quite controversial and there's been lots of follow on from it. More recently um, uh, work with IUCN on, on climate change um, which some of you will be familiar with um, and uh, lots of debate subsequently as you'll have seen probably in the media about how the relationship between livestock production and climate change uh, is such that uh, livestock are often accused um, of causing the major uh, as a major source of, uh, of greenhouse uh, greenhouse gases and a major uh, driver of climate change. Hence all the debates about should we, if we care about climate, eat meat and, and so on. A debate that we can come back to. Problem is a lot of generalizations in there because not often we're talking about well which livestock systems are causing environmental damage, which where uh, are there alternatives to these livestock systems. Um, if we all become 
vegan, which I have no problem with, uh, who is going to buy the meat from, from or, or livestock products from places where incredibly poor people, as we saw before, are producing livestock products in places where alternative production systems are just simply not possible. These sort of debates are, have uh, resonated uh, recently. There's been quite a lot of debate, uh, top right corner there, around uh, the relationships between pastoralism, peace and security. Um, issues of conflict. Um, of course, pastoral areas are not um, immune from conflict, just as, as many other areas. But as we saw before, conflicts over land use, over water, over uh, resources have intensified in recent years. And conflict issues very, very much on, on, on the policy agenda, high up on the policy agenda. Accelerated, of course, in certain parts of the world by the post 9-11 debate about terror and terrorism are these places which are, are fostering new forms of, of secession and terrorism which has invite, has uh, projected pastoral areas as areas of strategic interest for the United States and other uh, other Western powers in particular raising other questions of wider questions of governance and so on uh, moving down in the middle, there is uh, a World Bank document, and there are many others um, uh, that I could have chosen, uh, talking about investing in pastoralism. This seems to go, as many of these debates in policy, in cycles. But it's returning again. This is a, an older document, uh, authored by Case de Haan, who was a great supporter of pastoralism within the, within the World Bank. But there are others coming back, USAID, DFID and international NGOs, particularly for Africa, thinking about pastoral areas again, often in relation to environment and climate as the framing uh, issues. Um, and broader questions of governance and resilience, uh, which seems to be the buzzword of the moment, um, being uh, ways that policy debates more broadly are framing discussions of pastoral development. So there are different narratives within these debates and one could look in more depth, I've taken a very broad view here, you could look in more depth in a particular place and ask how are different policy debates competing with each other over time to frame and construct the way we think about pastoral development in any, in any particular place. And it's going to be affected by national policies, the relationship to international debates, and so on. And I think there are, as I mentioned before, incre an increasing focus on pastoral areas as a source for new forms of economic growth, new forms of investment, new forms of infrastructural development. These are places where oil pipelines, uh, investment corridors, um, processes that are, are very central to national economic growth um, are being centered on and makes pastoral areas particularly sensitive as areas where, uh, where these new forms of investment are happening. Often with that type of ignorance, that type of lack of understanding and, and, and failure to reflect on historical perspectives that we saw for Ethiopia but replicated elsewhere in policy debates. So a real importance of bringing deeper understandings of pastoral areas and pastoral economies and pastoral societies into these discussions lest these new interventions in the name of economic growth run roughshod over pastoral, uh, pastoral um, livelihoods. So in our debates about uh, pastoralism in pastures, we focus particularly on questions of uncertainty and thinking about pastoralists in that definition I mentioned right at the beginning as people who make use of uncertainty as a resource, make use of the variability in landscapes, in resources, over time and over space in interesting ways. And the so-called non-equilibrium paradigm that I mentioned um, before associated with the Woburn conferences in the late, the early 90s, um, 
has been updated, has been challenged, has become a focus for interesting debate, and goodness knows how many PhD and master's theses around the world. Um, there have been some nice summary reviews, and we'll come to some of these and the reflections from them in a future talk, but I put up here the covers of two, one by Susie Vetter a while back, published as a uh, plus from South Africa's uh, working paper, but also came out and as a journal article, and a very nice piece of work by Severio Kratley, who's pushed this debate further than we ever did way back then, uh, to think about living off uncertainty, not just with passively with uncertainty, a very important move in that debate. So valuing variability, embracing uncertainty, as it were, are key mottos. But as we explore in the later talks in this series, the way that modernist in institutions, the way development is constructed, the way planning and intervention uh, plays out, often sits very uneasily with this paradigm. That's why this paradigm has not necessarily had the purchase it might have had. So a generation on, we all sat in the early 90s thinking, yes, this is now going to revolutionise and recast everything we've ever thought about. We'll produce some books, um, everyone will read them and everything will change. Well, that, I mean, I don't think we really believe that, but it certainly didn't happen. Um, because there are changes in context which make the new context for pastoralism 25 years on quite different to what we were debating then. We focused then particularly on uh, on rangeland resources and its variability but I think now we have to think much more concretely about how those are changing within new political economies of pastoralism. So you know issues of land grabbing, of enclosure, of privatization, of investment are changing the way pastoral systems operate as we've said before. And that final document not very clear on this slide is uh, a, a nice piece um, uh, put together for lands by the Lands of the Future group, um, a mixture of, of pastoralists and, and academics thinking about these sort of issues um, more generally. So as I said, pastoral systems are facing a whole array of new uncertainties in the contemporary era that perhaps we need to think about a little bit more concretely as we think about the future of pastoralism. So the details of the uh, pictures uh, and, and uh, graphs on here uh, are not necessary, but they illustrate four different aspects of changing dynamics of uncertainty that I think we should, should bear in mind. First, of course, is climate. Now, we know much more about climate change than we did 25 years ago. We know for sure it's happening, but we also know a certain amount about how new forms of variability in climate and indeed in weather, different thing, is going to affect drylands. But there are huge uncertainties in there, again, as we'll discuss in a future, in a future talk. Uh, we have huge arrays of different, increasingly sophisticated model, models that tell us um, that uh, drylands are likely to, to expand uh, in many parts of the world, and particularly Africa, but, but crucially, the, the big lesson that comes out of most of this modelling debate, and it's summar uh, simplifying grossly, there's going to be more variability, there's going to be more uncertainty in environmental conditions. So therefore, living with, living off uncertainty becomes even more crucial. To the right there is a, a, a are, um, some projections on demography and population growth. Again, the details don't need to 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 concern you, but the the basic story in dryland areas throughout the world. These are some of the areas where population growth is the highest. High birth rates, declining mortality, thankfully, particularly declining. Um, maternal mortality, which still is shockingly high levels in some areas, but also migrations both out and into these areas um, with new flows that are happening. So demography in all its versions is, uh, is dramatically affecting these areas. These are no longer, they're still low population density compared to, I don't know, the Gangetic Plains or southern England. 
but they st- they are increasing there are increasing pressures um, uh, demographic pressures and changing forms of demography different uh, age profiles gender profiles and so on uh, in these areas what I'm left there settlement the growth of small towns urban areas in pastoral settings now in Africa as I mentioned before some of the fastest growing towns in many countries with, with dryland areas include are those in pastoral areas um, huge growth with big big implications part of this is associated with patterns of settlement of pastoralists who are no longer as mobile as they once were part of this is a result of infrastructure investment roads and then associated transport links that are allowing people to make use of new uh, new forms of economic connection. Part of it's it's the attraction of schooling and um, churches, mosques, other forms of religious uh, uh, sites which allow which people are encouraged to settle. It's fueled by um, changing in trading relationships in these areas, new forms of investment, particularly from diaspora, associated with remittance flows all having linkages uh, with pastoral settings so whether you look in in west africa east africa and other parts of of the world this is a dynamic that is really there and unless we understand that um, then we can't understand pastoral systems there's no point in thinking just romantically about a wandering nomadic pastoralist we are has to think about connections to town where people live how people split families how people uh, operate new forms of mobility often assisted by new forms of technology the coverage of mobile phone networks is often better in pastoral areas than it is in places in rural England uh, these days um, this allows people to move cash around it may allows people to have connections um, to markets and so on so pastoral areas are unquestionably changing allowing new opportunities but also new forms of uncertainty and this Final slide here, final picture here, uh, is linked, of course, to markets. Um, markets uh, have changed again in pastoral areas, and here I'm focusing, and this is a picture of, of Bosaso Port in Somaliland, um, which takes huge volumes of animals, both live, and particularly live animals, to the Middle East and the Arabian Peninsula more broadly associated with religious festivals, the Hajj and so on, but also increases in meat consumption of increasingly richer middle class people in towns um, and cities, uh, not only in the Middle East, but in the, in the region as a whole. Uh, Chris Delgado and others way back uh, coined the term the livestock revolution, uh, an analysis of global changes in livestock demand and despite the fact that you know many people are, are moving towards more vegetarian diets the overall trajectory remains increased meat consumption um, that may not be only red meats but it may be other forms of meat but certainly the demand for meat um, and livestock products uh, continues to increase and this has impacts on uh, pastoral areas not surprisingly it's not just local sale building herds for own consumption this is a much more dynamic commercialized commodified economy uh, which is affecting uh, the way that people engage with mar the re relationship between markets and pastoralism a theme that we will discuss again in a later session so what is what do we make of all of this um, in preparing this talk, I went back to a electronic debate we had um, under the auspices of the Future Agricultures Consortium, which is hosted by IDS and a network of African partners, uh, way back in um, 2006, I think, thereabouts. And because we invited Stephen Sanford, who was author of that book that I mentioned, um, published in 1983, who was a mentor to many of us working on pastoralism, um, because he'd become in his old age slightly controversial, as you should. Um, and 
he was saying, well, I've supported pastoralism all my life, but now I just don't think it's, it's you know, it, it's gone beyond. And all of us were saying, oh, my goodness, Stephen, you can't say that. So he wrote in a very uh, precise and clear style why he thought that was the case as an opening to a, an electronic debate, which actually attracted lots of interaction. Um, and he argued this, basically, and I'll try and summarise it, but it's worth, worth reading the exchanges, because I think the exchanges, even though it's a while ago now, are still relevant today. He argued that, essentially, there were too many people and too few livestock. That was the title of his little intervention. Um, herd and flock sizes are just not sufficient for people to gain a successful livelihood. That there's not enough opportunities for diversification, for people to get other forms of income to keep them alive, and that the rate of poverty and destitution is increasing dramatically in pastoral areas. Um, he argued equally that the type of in technical investments that had produced incremental forms of increasing efficiency, he's an economist, um, Stephen, so these are the sort of thing questions that he would be asking, the type of investments in uh, range, rangeland improvement, uh, breed improvement, and so on, are not going to not going to basically keep up with population population pressures. So you can't just expect Ilri or whoever, an organisation he worked for for decades or, or at least a decade, um, to come up with a magical technical solution that's going to make pastoralism forever productive. So his argument was well. You know, basically, it's 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 hit the buffers. The crisis is there. It's real, and that uh, we have to think very hard um, and not get caught in a romantic vision of pastoralism of the past, and think about transforming pastoralism rag radically, including investing in irrigated agriculture in dryland areas and getting people out of pastoralism in large numbers. So it was quite a controversial position for somebody who's seen over decades to be a the supporter of pastoralism. So Stephen Devereux, who also works at IDS and myself, um, wrote the initial first response and then we invited a number of others and they're worth reading. Um, we rejected what we saw as a, as a sort of narrow neo-Malthusian argument. You know, Malthus always said, you know, population growth is going to destroy everyone and there will be conflict and so on and so forth, um, environmental degradation and the rest. This seemed to us like a, a narrow Malthusian argument without faith in the adaptation capacity of pastoral systems, which we've seen over many years. And we pointed to past interventions going back to this 50s and so on, where people had said the same thing. Pastoralism is in crisis. We've got to change. We've got to modernize. We remember all of these interventions in southern Ethiopia said the similar thing. Yet pastoralism still is there. 20 years, 30 years, 40 years on. What's happening? Well, people adapt, people manage, people invent, people change. That was our argument. Our argument equally is that people can't just be left to change on their own. There are real pressures. It needs particular strategic forms of support, but it doesn't necessarily mean investing in large irrigation schemes and putting pastoralists on those, because the history of irrigation schemes, as we pointed out, uh, is pretty appalling in Africa as elsewhere. Anyway, there was an interesting discussion, and actually, uh, again, whatever, whatever it is now, 12 years, 13 years on, having reread Stephen's intervention, we were very cross at the time, so we wrote sort of slightly cross response. You can see where he's coming from. Um, and you can see the type of pressures he's talking about. But equally in the, re the response that Stephen, I, Jeremy Swift and many others had, a focus on adaptability, change and the dynamics of pastoral settings, I think is equally relevant. There's a nice paper by uh, Terry McCabe and others on northern Tanzania which uh, which makes the argument that pastoralists are adopting agriculture to remain in pastoralism 
Um, this is a phenomenon we see in many, many places. So people are sustaining pastoralism. In fact, they will grow maize under incredibly difficult circumstances in order to reinvest in buying uh, cattle and goats. So it's not to say that they're no longer pastoralists just because they're growing maize. Their actual whole aim is to sustain their herds, but in a different way to the, what they were able to do before. Um, unlike in the Having Herds book of Dahl and Hjort way back in the 70s, the idea of having a herd of 100 in order to get uh, offspring of 10 every year, sell those or eat those, get the milk from the... Um, the milking cows or goats to sustain a whole household is not going to happen. Very, very few people can be, as it were, pure pastoralists like that. And even back then, many people weren't. Anyway, that debate provoked a, a, a much wider debate even than the e-debate. And Mark Moritz and colleagues went uh, and who work in West Africa, a lot of this debate was focused on what we called the Greater Horn in East Africa. And they published a paper a few years later in the Journal of Development Studies, which was a comparative analysis of seven different cases, and you can see them starred on the diagram here, um, and made the case, I was glad to say, uh, that said in West Africa, the Sanford thesis, as it became called, was not upheld. Why? because, just as I said, the adaptability of systems, particularly in this area, they argued, was such that pastoral, pastoral societies were able to, to, to change despite this 2 to 3% annual growth of population. Bioclimatic conditions allowed in, in West Africa, these, these colours are different, uh, different levels of aridity, heading from the coast wetter to the north drier. Um, the bioclimatic conditions, the broader ecological conditions in West Africa allow agriculture to be mixed with pastoralism probably in an easier way than it is in most of more arid or at least more extensive arid areas in East Africa. So you get this integration and intensification that allows pastoralism, although huge amounts of conflict as you will know from news reports in northern Nigeria and the use of agricultural residues, cotton seed and so on, to support and intensify pastoral production. Southern Mali produces a lot of cotton, that's vitally important for, um, for livestock fodder, for example. Along the coast of West Africa, there are a lot of huge towns, you know, from Lagos to Accra to, um, uh, to others right along the coast. These are major drivers of, of market demand and huge demand um, for livestock products. So that is another uh, aspect that Mark and co uh, focused on. And they pointed out that actually investment in technologies are allowing these adaptations to occur. They pointed to boreholes, donkey carts, watering tubes, trypanosomiasis treatments, um, including crossbreeding, allowing livestock to move into the more humid zones, and so on. So essentially they said that simplistic neo-Malthusian thesis of Sanford may apply in the odd place in the arid drylands which don't have the opportunity to diversify and connect to markets, but it's not a bigger story, certainly in West Africa. They adopted what uh, might be called a Bozrupian, following Esther Bozrup, classic analysis of technical change in agriculture from the 1960s, who rejected the Malthusian argument and said actually population pressure can be the incentive, the biggest incentive and the most important incentive for agricultural innovation. And just as in agriculture, Bozrup Moritz and al. et al. argue um, pastoralism changes and innovates. Here's an interesting hypothesis. Does this apply elsewhere, that type of change? But going back to East Africa, and in this case the Somali region of Ethiopia, one can see trends and dynamics 
um, that are important to understand contemporary pastoralism. And I think a historical perspective on pastoralism is vital. This data comes uh, from uh, Andy Catley and colleagues at Tufts University, and they're based in Ethiopia. And done a lot of work in, done a lot of work in uh, southern Ethiopia and Somali region in particular. Not admittedly from 1922, but they did compile uh, interesting data from 1922 to 2010. So I don't, you won't be able to see the uh, the uh, the key on here. Um, too easily, but maybe you can guess which of the different colours represents what trend. The blue one is population. I mean, it's an extrapolation on a population growth um, curve. So, demographic pressure in the drylands is real, um, and I think you know, even though we reject Malthusian arguments, forgetting questions of population dynamics, human population dynamics, and the, the ratio between humans and livestock uh, is a mistake. The red one is annual rainfall. And this was a surprise when they compiled this data because everyone said, oh, well, Somali region must be getting worse. Droughts are coming, climate change is coming, and so on. Well, actually, long-term trends suggest actually no long-term trend, but variability. Um, that may change with climate change, but it's not kicking in yet. So that was an important one uh, to notice. The green one is livestock exports. Highly variable because of politics, because of livestock disease, because of conflict, because of a whole variety of things, but increasing. I mean, you can't really put a trend line on it. But the growth of trade that I mentioned before from Somaliland um, uh, is vital for this particular system. Now, you could draw these figures uh, and these type of analysis for any place, but I think they, they, they are revealing of the type of dynamic. So, in our debate with Stephen Sanford, he, uh, he focused particularly on the blue story and the ratio of, of, of humans to livestock. Too, uh, too many people, too few livestock, was his argument. You can see where that's coming from. But if you focus particularly on markets, you could say, well, here's a real opportunity, market commercialization, real opportunities opening up. So you can see that pastoral systems, because of the dynamic nature and, you know, the, uh, although human populations don't oscillate so much, certainly rainfall and certainly market ex uh, export markets that, uh, definitely do. Uncertainty is there. This was background to another piece of work that uh, that Andy Catley, Jakob Aklilu, and others did, which I think is really important. We'll come probably back to this again and again, because it's one of the few studies that over time has looked at patterns of differentiation within a pastoral setting. And what was important here, and the details here I don't, you don't need to worry about, you can read the original paper, is that in the period before 1974 and the period after 1974, one saw an increasing, increasing inequality in wealth in pastoral areas. And I think this is a pattern you see in many places. Richer people are getting richer, poorer people are getting poorer. And the poorer people, are, poorer people are getting really poor and sometimes very often leaving pastoralism altogether. And this, this question of social differentiation links to a wider question which isn't often asked in pastoral studies, partly because, again, the tradition of pastoral studies was to think about pastoralism as a unified, almost homogeneous, um, uh, uh, type of uh, 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 a form of, of culture where differentiation uh, was not really central. But actually differentiation, just as any society, is central. And it's differentiation by class and wealth, differentiation by gender, differentiation by age, uh, differentiation by ethnicity. 
And trying to understand how patterns of social differentiation are affecting pastoral economies, I think, is a really, really core question. Not well asked in the literature, and we've got a subsequent session uh, on this, and you'll see the literature is a bit scarce, which is why uh, this study, moving up or moving out, uh, is really important, because it poses questions, are people able to accumulate and improve their livelihoods, or are they not able to do that and have to move out? And that's, as I say, differentiated by all sorts of axes of difference. And this is a really big question associated with questions of, you know, who are the new pastoralists? Do they live in town? Are they absentee uh, pastoralists who are investing in these areas? Or are they people who are moving out of pastoralism almost altogether with one or two goats and not much else? This old image of the pastoralists roaming the rangelands with their large herds uh, may still exist for a few, but increasingly less and less. And that has implications for how we think about the relationship between uncertainty and pastoralism. To try and get a, a much deeper analysis of social differentiation, patterns of differential accumulation, class formation in pastoral societies, and gender analysis, and indeed generational analysis, becomes absolutely crucial. Okay, so where do we end up with? We had, after all of these discussions, a, uh, a, a debate and a conference held at, in Addis Ababa in 2011, I think, where we asked the question, well, what's the future of pastoralism in Africa? And we invited lots of people, including people who commented on pastoral debates from over decades, but more importantly, and I think reflected in this book, new scholars, scholars who've been studying pastoral areas, particularly in the Greater Horn of Africa, um, from those regions. Compared to all of those old classic books, which were slightly old white men reporting on pastoral areas, this was much more of a, uh, a, a diverse uh, set of contributions of people from pastoral areas, writing about pastoral areas and thinking about the future of pastoralism in new and different ways. Um, one of the things that uh, guided this discussion emerged out of an earlier debate um, which was actually developed again by Ethiopian pastoralists, policy makers, practitioners, which was a way of thinking about, well, what are the multiple futures of pastoralism? This was a classic scenario analysis. You'll be familiar with these and we chose two main drivers out of a lot of discussion. In other areas, the two main drivers may be different, but the two that were chosen by this group was access to resources and access to markets, high and low, respectively. And out of just plotting those two axes, one has uh, four different scenarios, which seem to fit with what we were seeing and seem to fit with the experiences of people studying particular areas uh, who were presenting at the conference. Now the relative importance of each of the four quadrants, more traditional mobile pastoralism, moving towards much more commercialized pastoralism, uh, exiting pastoralism and seeking alternative livelihoods in the area or outside, or linking in, in other ways to the pastoral economy through forms of added value diversification in these small towns, milk marketing and so on and so forth. It seemed to fit. And the relative proportion of which of those were the outcomes in any particular place varied dramatically. But we, and we mapped those in interesting ways. And the different outcomes not only varied by place, depending on who you were. So richer people, I mean, uh, richer people, women, uh, younger people, older people may have ended up in different areas of these quadrants. I found it a useful way, and I still find it a useful way of thinking in a slightly simplistic way about the type of trade-offs we see. But of course, the immediate response is, well, of course, there are a lot of other variables and these just, just these two, of course. Uh, but what you can do in a scenarios analysis is then start to think about, well, what moves things around? This was just the result of one of the group breakout discussions in the, in the conference way back then. So whether it's land investment or disease or conflict or 
whatever, we can end up with things shifting. So scenarios are not fixed, they're subject to shock, stresses, changes. Those are the uncertainties that we're interested in the Pastres project. So these drivers interact, they, they influence how we think about the world, they're affected by governance, they're affected by uh, questions of politics, they're affected by ecological processes, they're affected by economy and so on. Uh, they're not um, obvious and in any place one could, could do that, uh, could do that sort of analysis. Um, okay, I'm going to conclude more or less now. So pastoral studies have often operated slightly in isolation but we're pursuing this discussion at the Institute of Development Studies and in association with the STEP Centre uh, which is focused particularly on the politics of sustainability. I think bringing pastoral studies out of their ghetto, if you like, their slightly isolated set of debates amongst people who are only interested in pastoralism is an important move. And I think, as I've tried to show in this talk, the type of debates that are central to pastoralism are also central to bigger debates in development, but with nuances and particularities because of the context. So whether we're talking about the, the big debate in development between states and markets, well, that's an obvious one that we can see. Whether we're talking about poverty or resilience or well-being or livelihoods, we can see that that's a central one. Whether we're talking about, as I've just mentioned, social difference, class, gender, age, generation, and so on. Whether we're talking about environment and, and demographic change, as we've also discussed, or whether we're talking about governance, security, and the politics of policy as we've also discussed, all of these have particular forms and particular sets of debates uh, within pastoralism. What I think a lot of pastoralist studies has failed to do very effectively is link these wider debates that are as relevant in, in non-pastoral areas as they are in pastoral areas to pastoral settings and ask the, the question, what difference does a dry land pastoral setting beset by different forms of uncertainty make to these bigger questions. And I think this is, is both an intellectual but also a practical policy set of, uh, uh, of adventures is important because if pastoralism and pastoral debates are not to continue just to be isolated, seen as peripheral to the mainstream, then we as those people concerned with pastoralism have to link them to the mainstream debates. That said, I don't want to leave aside the rich tradition of so-called pastoralism studies. As I've tried to explain in this talk, there has been you know, various phases of these type of studies from the 60s and 70s, where there was great optimism for transforming livestock production, ranching schemes, livestock projects, and so on, as we saw from Ethiopia, replicated elsewhere. By the 80s, there was much more of a questioning of that mainstream view. Ilka led the way in, in thinking about um, pastoral, pastoralism as a part of a system. And we had early predictions of this pattern of social um, differentiation and so-called pauperization of pastoralism from early studies um, by Lane Kopok and many others. Um, uh, from the, from the 80s. From the 90s, partly because of this focus on the new rangeland ecology from Ellis and Swift and the books that I mentioned earlier on, we had a, a bigger critique from an ecological perspective, which transformed by the 2000s into a reflection, okay, if we understand the new range ecology, what does this mean for other areas? So questions of, of governance, of, of markets, of representation of uh, politics became more and more significant. So the question for us, I guess, is what's the what are the challenges now? How do we, how do we move debates on? Um, what are the particular challenges for pastres? Well, as mentioned several times, of course, our focus is particularly on, on questions of how new forms of uncertainty, um, as constructed by different groups of people, 
are affecting uh, responses and practices on the ground and how this varies across the world is a is an interesting question and I think that results in a lot of focus necessarily on questions of land, territory, investment in pastoral areas and the changing politics of institutions in, around land control in particular become important. But also there are a range of novel adaptations that are happening. Um, pastoralists are innovating around new technologies, new forms of practice, new styles of mobility for example, um, retaining the principle of mobility but doing it in different ways. As I mentioned before, uh, a focus on social difference, class, gender, generation, um, a rather more inclusive view of pastoral societies is differentiated. And as pastoralists integrate um, with markets, not just a focus on trade, but on a focus on how pastoralists construct a new economy, new forms of market relations. And I think all of this requires us to think a little, in a little bit more of a disaggregated way about pastoralism. Rather than getting stuck in either pastoralists are making it on their own, a, a sort of reification of the success of commercialization, or the opposite, the doom and gloom narrative, which is about only about uh, humanitarian aid and relief and, uh, and, and social protection measures. We have to get beyond that and I think the lectures that then follow are going to try and help us unpick different elements of that and develop a critical perspective on thinking about pastoralism that allows us a little bit more uh, nuance in these debates and pushes us forward. So I will end there um, with some of the credits for the photos and beyond.